Last time, we left off with Kepler's mathematical model for the motion of Mars that aired from observation by only two arc minutes, making Kepler's results nearly a hundred times more accurate than any astronomers before him. Kepler developed and tested his model using a dataset of 12 of Tycho Brahe's observations, each carefully chosen to occur when Mars was in opposition, where the Earth is directly between the Sun and Mars. This choice allowed Kepler to effectively ignore the location of Earth and pretend that Tycho's observations were taken from the Sun. At this point, most astronomers before Kepler would have declared victory and moved on. For most of its history, astronomy was about making accurate predictions, such as when the next eclipse would occur. Kepler's model did this incredibly well for the retrograde motions of Mars, predicting when and at what angle in an overhead view Mars would be in opposition. But Kepler wanted more from astronomy. It's difficult to imagine today but for most of the history of science, astronomy and physics were completely separate disciplines. No one was really concerned with why the planets in Ptolemy's model moved in epicycles. It was enough that Ptolemy's model made reliable predictions, and the reasons why the heavens moved the way they did were left to philosophy and theology. Kepler not only believed that he could figure out exactly how the planets moved through space, but why the planets moved as they did. This is what makes Kepler such a powerful figure in the history of science. The writer Arthur Koestler says that Kepler's new approach after Tycho's death was as if a new species had arisen on the planet. Kepler knew there was more than one way to look at his equant-based model of the motion of Mars. The most obvious was to look at it from a side view instead of an overhead view. Tycho's observations captured not only the longitude of Mars as seen in an overhead view, but also the latitude which is the angle above or below the plane of the Earth's orbit around the Sun. Unlike Mars' longitude values, Kepler could not assume that Mars' latitude values were the same as seen from the Earth and the Sun. Kepler realized that he could use this fact to check the distance he had initially computed between the Sun and the center of Mars' orbit. The orbit of Mars is slightly tilted relative to Earth's orbit. Taking the value Kepler knew for this tilt and Tycho's observed latitude for the 1585 opposition, Kepler was able to construct this triangle and compute all of its angles. The base of the triangle is the distance between the Sun and Earth, which Kepler had an upper and lower estimate for, again thanks to Tycho's observations. Using the law of signs, Kepler was able to compute an upper and lower estimate for the distance between the Sun and Mars at the 1585 opposition. Now Kepler added in Tycho's 1593 observation, which falls close to the opposite side of Mars' orbit. Using the same law of science math, Kepler again computed the distance between the Sun and Mars. Kepler found the center of Mars' orbit by dividing the distance between his two observations by two, and finally computed the distance between the Sun and the orbit center. After normalizing his result to match his longitude calculations, he computed that the distance should be between 0.08 and 0.09943. However, his carefully tuned overhead longitude-based method yielded a distance of 0.11332, a worst case error of around 40%. This was a huge problem. Kepler noticed that his newly computed sun-centered distance put the center of Mars' orbit approximately at the midpoint between the sun and equant, just as Ptolemy had in his model 1500 years before. Questioning if Ptolemy actually had it right all along, Kepler made this change to his model, returned to his overhead view, and recomputed his longitudes. His astounding two minutes of arc error now jumped to eight minutes. Eight minutes of arc, or 0.13 degrees, is still an incredibly small error. It's about the thickness of four index cards held at arm's length. But Kepler knew that Tycho's observations had an accuracy of around two arc minutes, and refused to accept this model. Kepler ends chapter 19 of Astronomia Nova with a powerful prediction. Now, because they could not be ignored, these eight minutes alone will have led the way to the reformation of all of astronomy and have become the material for a great part of the present work. With Tycho out of the picture, Kepler was now free to rebuild astronomy from the ground up. Dissatisfied with purely mathematical descriptions of the cosmos, Kepler was on a mission to reunite astronomy and physics. What caused the planets to move as they did? Kepler believed deeply and intuitively that the sun was the source of the movement of the planets. Grasping for some mechanism that would allow the sun to magically exert force at such large distances Kepler landed on magnetism as the driving force of the planet's motion around the sun. Newton's theory of gravity was still 80 years away, and in fact, Newton would draw heavily on Kepler's work. 
Kepler postulated that the magnetic driving force of the sun would become weaker the further a planet was from the sun. This would explain the uneven speed of Mars in a completely different and more physical way than Ptolemy's abstract idea of the equant. The closer Mars was to the sun on its orbit, the faster the sun would push it along. Mathematically, Kepler made the velocity of Mars inversely proportional to its distance to the sun. While this theory was nice physically, it meant that the velocity of Mars was always changing, making it a nightmare computationally. With calculus not quite yet discovered, Kepler resorted to breaking planetary motions into lots of little triangles and assuming constant velocity for each. In doing this, Kepler noticed that the time it took a planet to transverse the base of one of his triangles was proportional to the area of the triangle. Today, we know this is Kepler's second law. Planets sweep out equal areas and equal times along their orbits. However, to Kepler in 1602, this was still completely a hunch, based on the faulty assumption that the sun magnetically forced the planets around their orbits, and that this magnetic force was inversely proportional to distance. After laboriously showing that his method worked well for the orbit of the Earth around the sun, Kepler returned to the orbit of Mars. Kepler now had a completely new method, the equal area approach for computing the location of Mars at a given time. How would this new approach compare to Tycho's incredibly accurate observations? Instead of comparing directly to observation, Kepler cleverly used his highly accurate but incorrect model from earlier as a baseline. As long as he was only using the overhead view, he knew the maximum error of this model relative to Tycho's observations would be only two arc minutes. Comparing to his earlier model allowed Kepler to quickly gauge the accuracy of the equal area approach at any angle. At an angle of 90 degrees, the equal area approach fared well, yielding an error of only 24 arc seconds. While at 45 degrees, Kepler's equal area approach moved the planet too quickly, and at 135 degrees, too slowly, each with an error of around eight arc minutes. Given that Kepler had basically made up the equal area method out of thin air by assuming the sun was a big magnet, an error of just eight arc minutes is an incredibly impressive result, but not for Kepler. He immediately went deeper and used this error to launch a final attack on the most firmly held belief in astronomy since the time of the ancients, that the planets move in perfect circles. Kepler saw that if he bowed the path of Mars inward, his model would better align with the observed angles. To definitively show that the planets did not move in circles, Kepler used a clever triangulation technique. Every 687 days, Mars arrives at the same location on its orbit. Kepler used observations from Tycho's data spaced 687 days apart, effectively fixing the location of Mars in his analysis. From here, Kepler was able to solve for the angles and distances in the triangles formed between the Earth, Sun, and Mars. Using multiple observations with the Earth in different positions allowed Kepler to make his overall model more consistent. Using multiple sets of these fixed Mars observations, Kepler was able to show that the path of Mars did indeed bow inwards and officially rejected the circle. Abandoning thousands of years of astronomical tradition left Kepler with more questions than answers. Circles are not only nice aesthetically, but very straightforward mathematically. Kepler spent the next year of his life pursuing an ingenious solution to revolutionize astronomy. The egg. Kepler knew that the true path of Mars bowed inward from a circle. After rejecting the circle in chapter 44 of Astronomia Nova, Kepler declares that the path of Mars must be some sort of oval. The problem with the oval is that there's no single mathematically precise definition. Many mathematical techniques can be used to create ovalish shapes. Kepler was well aware of the ellipse and frequently used it as a computational device, but rejected it early on as the path of Mars, writing in a letter that if the solution was as simple as an ellipse, surely the ancient Greeks would have found it. To create an oval, Kepler reached for a mathematical tool that he had just spent years removing from astronomy, the epicycle. However, unlike the loopy epicycles of Ptolemy, here Kepler had his epicycle rotate slowly and in the opposite direction of the circle that it rode on. Kepler used his equal area method to move the epicycle itself around the circle at a non-uniform rate, but used a uniform rate for the motion of Mars on its epicycle, because he couldn't find any physical justification for Mars' movement on its epicycle to be non-uniform. The resulting path of Mars from this model is the egg, Comparing the egg to observation, Kepler found that the egg overshot the observed curvature by roughly a factor of two. The egg was difficult to work with mathematically and could not be easily adjusted, and Kepler found himself going in circles, recomputing the distance to the sun, trying again and again to make his model work. 
After a difficult year of financial troubles, health issues, and a fruitless battle with the egg, Kepler by pure chance bumped into a number that would change the future of astronomy and science. 0 0.00429 0 0.00429 is the maximum width of the gap between a perfect circular orbit and Kepler's triangulated curve for the path of Mars. In a separate line of investigation, Kepler had studied an angle that he called the optical equation. In Kepler's egg model and Ptolemy's famous equant model, the Sun is not at the center of Mars' orbit. The optical equation is the angle formed between the line from Mars to the center of its orbit and the line from Mars to the Sun. Kepler noticed that the optical equation reached a maximum value of 5.3 degrees, when the angle between Mars and the Sun reached 90. By pure chance, Kepler noticed that the secant, or 1 over the cosine of this angle, is 1.00429 or exactly 1 plus the gap between the observed path of Mars and the circle. At this point, Kepler wrote that he felt he'd been awakened from a sleep. Kepler saw that if he modified his epicycle egg model to make the distance between Mars and the Sun proportional to the secant of the optical equation, his model would match Tycho's observations. In his full epicycle model, this is equivalent to projecting the position of Mars on its epicycle onto the line between the center of the epicycle and the Sun. This gives the distance between the Sun and Mars, but not the final location of Mars. To find the final location of the planet, this distance should be swung over to intersect the horizontal line between the original position of Mars and the vertical. Kepler didn't realize it yet, but after four long years since Tycho had assigned him to work on Mars, and after throwing out almost all of traditional astronomy, he had found the answer. The intersection of this arc and line trace out a perfect ellipse by far the most accurate model of the path of Mars constructed by any human up until that point. However, in one final plot twist, Kepler bungled the construction. He took the intersection of the arc and the line between the center of the circle and the original position of Mars instead of the horizontal line. This choice results in an oddly shaped oval that did not match observations well. Frustrated, Kepler threw out his entire numerical epiphany in favor of what he thought was a new idea, an ellipse. Only in constructing his new ellipse did he finally realize that he had already discovered it. In his summary of this chapter in Astronomia Nova, Kepler writes that he subconsciously repaired his own error. Kepler showed us, arguably for the first time, what it really looks like to do modern science. Instead of having philosophical debates on how nature should work, Tycho and Kepler turned to methodical observation and messy experimentation. 80 years after Kepler discovered the ellipse, Isaac Newton would publish the theory of gravity in his Principia. When the book was recorded by the Royal Society, it was introduced as a mathematical demonstration of the Copernican hypothesis as proposed by Kepler. As Stephen Hawking writes, it was Kepler's third law, and not an apple, that led Isaac Newton to discover the law of gravitation. There's this amazingly clear path from Tycho's observations to Kepler's experimentation to Newton's laws that really is the blueprint for modern science. Richard Feynman captures this really nicely in his lecture on gravitation. It's hard to exaggerate the importance of the effect on the history of science produced by this great success of the theory of gravitation. Compare the confusion, lack of confidence, the incomplete knowledge that prevailed in the earlier ages, when there were endless debates and paradoxes, with the clarity and simplicity of this law. This fact that all the moons and planets and stars have such a simple rule to govern them, and further that man could understand it and deduce how the planets should move, this is the reason for the success of the sciences in the following years. For it gave hope that the other phenomena of the world might also have such beautifully simple laws. Tycho's model of the cosmos turned out to be wrong but it did make for some really beautiful illustrations, like this amazing chart published by Johann Gabriel Doppelmayr in the early 1700s, showing the loopy paths of Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn from 1712 to 1713, according to Tycho's model. You can find original printings from the 1700s for sale online. I really want one, but they're a little pricey. I was able to find and purchase a copyright-free super high-res image, which I made into a poster available for purchase at the link below. I slightly modified the proportions to fit nicely into a standard 13 by 15 inch frame. In my research for this video, I also came across this incredibly intricate illustration of the Tychonic model. It's from this insane 1660 book called Harmonia Macrocosmica, 
often described as the most beautiful celestial atlas ever published. There's an original copy for sale on Abe Books right now for just $375,000. But not to worry, shipping is only fourteen fifty. dollars you can buy a poster version of this illustration at the link below. I also modified this one ever so slightly to fit into a standard 13 by 16 inch frame. 